So today, a day in the life digitization of the digitization unit or digital projects um, with David Gwynn, who is our coordinator in that area. I'm really excited. We had a lot of interest in people um, wanting to just hear what a day in the life is like in other departments or other units. So I am super excited to introduce David Gwynn. And David, I'll let you take it away. Hi, David. Um, you might have guessed that by this point. Um, originally, Erica was going to be sitting in on this too, but she had something come up and wasn't going to be, and uh, turned out not to be able to be here. So unfortunately, you're stuck with me for the next hour or so. I'll try not to make it too tedious. Uh, but, uh, and one thing about the presentation too, uh, the way this is put together, it's focused more on kind of the nuts and bolts of what we do than on specific collections and and cool stuff. Um, I would actually like to do a presentation on that at some later point after we finish the migration that we're working on right now, which I'll actually talk about a little bit later on in the process. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and jump in now. Um, so who are we? We are the digitization unit. Uh, yeah, and that's a uh, that was probably pretty simple. This is sort of the overview of what I plan to cover over the course of the uh, presentation, uh, how we select projects, sort of the nuts and bolts of what we do. And the last part is how we put it online and how that's going to, uh, uh, how the uh, migration of our content out of Content DM and into a program called Islandora figures into all of that. So let's get rolling. Who are we indeed? Uh, the digitization unit uh, is part of ERIT, which is the Electronic Resources and Information Technology Department. There are actually right now officially five or four and a quarter of us, depending on how you count that, plus a lot of students. Um, the team consists of, well, me, I'm the coordinator for the unit, plus, and we are one of the four units within ERIT, uh, the other ones being um, the support team, the development team, and uh, Terry, who is his own unit, basically. Um, but within the uh, digitization unit, we have uh, Callie Coward from Special Collections Cataloging, uh, Kathy Howard, Erica Rao, Brian Robinson, who many of you may not have met uh, yet. He's a postdoc fellow who's working in our department, uh, funded under uh, a clear grant. Uh, so he's a postdoc fellow in African American Studies and Data Curation. And again, then there's me. Uh, we also have kind of an extended family. We work with a lot of other departments. Uh, but for right now, this purposes, I'm going to say we have Claire Heckel, who's also a grant funded project coordinator for the People Not Property Project. And we'll talk about that a little bit more down the line. And Tiffany Henry, who works with us very closely, uh, working with us on metadata issues. Uh, and we'll talk about that more too. Tiffany's been very active in, uh, as has Callie with uh, manipulating the metadata, preparing us to move out of Content DM and into Islandora. We also work with a lot of students. Last semester, I think we had six students, six or seven working in any given moment, um, four or five of those grant funded, and um, uh, one or two departmental students as well. So we have a lot of students working up with us uh, um, in the building and sometimes not inside the building either. So one thing that a lot of people have had questions about over the past year or so are actually how we select the projects, how we decide what it is we're going to digitize and put online. Um, and there actually is a very specific library and to some extent university-wide process for this. There are a couple of different ways that projects come into our pipeline. Um, first up, let's think about who our audience is for our digitization projects. Uh, you might think it's just the university, but that's not really true. I, I think our primary audience actually is the general public. Uh, Reminds me a lot when I used to when I used to manage the campus radio station here at UNCG back in the dark ages of the early 1920s. Um, we used to remind people that uh, who were working on staff that our audience extended out into the community. It was not just the university. So uh, we we tried to avoid doing things like saying, "Oh, there's going to be on the air that oh, there's going to be a meeting in the EUC tonight because." chances are 60% of our listeners were not at the university and they didn't know what the EUC was. And I kind of think about that with our digital collections too. A bigger, actually probably a, the majority of our users are not necessarily accessing us from within the university. 
Uh, our audience includes amateur historians, building researchers, genealogists, historians, as well as faculty and students. And I would say that faculty and students are, uh, thank you, MK, I, 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 I try to take care of myself and I hope that I'm still looking okay when I'm 120 as well. Um, Faculty and students are a bigger part because we're actually working with a lot more classroom integration of our projects now too. We're working with a lot of faculty members to integrate their students in both working with and using our projects. So the first way that projects come into our <laughs> come into us is by the digital projects priorities team and uh, I think a lot of you have seen my calls that I usually do once and we may start doing them twice a year within the library for interesting projects. Um, the group called the Digital Projects Priorities Team, you see the lovely pictures on screen right now, are the ones who actually kind of review these applications and decide which projects we're going to pursue. And realistically, we do pursue most of these projects if we can. Now, who is on this team and why? Um, valid question. Uh, the, team is chaired by Tim Bucknell, who is the head of ERIT and my boss, uh, Christine Fisher from Technical Services, Kathleen Smith from SKUA, and well, me. Um, the reason these particular people were suggested is because these are the, th or are on the team, is because these are the three departments that generally have to commit the most resources to projects. Uh, specifically support and personnel to projects. So it makes sense to have the heads of those three departments, plus me who's in charge of digitization in general. We officially meet once a year to review projects, but recently we've been meeting several times a year just to discuss things. Uh, we also meet virtually, uh, either by email or other virtual means when we have project submissions or suggestions over the course of the year that are outside our usual submission time frame. And we basically look at the projects and decide how well they fit our ongoing goals and our selection criteria, which we'll talk about in a second, um, and how realistically, how realistic they are for us to pursue as projects. Uh, another way that projects come into us is by the digital partners grant system. Um, Many of you may have seen this too. This is something that uh, Richard started out, Richard Cox and Eric started out as the coordinator of on, on, and now these projects are funneled through the DRSS committee. These projects, uh, unlike the uh, digital project submissions, which are from the library only, these may be projects from the entire university and may not just involve digitization, but may also uh, involve other IT support for faculty research. So um, in general, you know, if we have five or six projects a year, maybe one or two of those would be actually related to digitization. All, and may they may involve various aspects of ERIT services. We commit to providing a certain amount of services to faculty research, um, not money, actually in-kind labor, and also, um, it's a competitive project open to the full university for each year. Um, and some interesting projects have come out of that too, like the I Wish to Say project, which is Cheryl Oring's uh, postcard project, which is kind of neat. Um, there's a link to how you apply for that on this slide as well. Um, we also do a lot of work on grant-based projects, community collaborations, etc. cetera. Um, as you see, some of the people that we've worked with in the past and that we work with on a regular basis now, um, we work very closely, for example, with the Greensboro History Museum and the Greensboro Public Library. We've done projects with all the universities and colleges in the area. Um, and we've pursued grant funding, usually with community partners to do projects like this uh, over the years. Uh, lots of different funding opportunities on that as well. We, uh, somebody proposes something we look at the possibility of doing that. It runs through the digital projects priorities team and we decide if we're gonna, gonna pursue it or not. So when we're contemplating projects, uh, we base it on several, several criteria. The biggest one being, you know, is it gonna have some kind of appeal and is it a realistic project for us to do? 
we have four primary focus areas for our digital collections um, that were determined years, several years ago based on our collection strengths, uh, university branding, et cetera, and sort of where our digital collections were already strong. Those four areas being local and regional history, which is Greensboro and statewide, UNCG history, obviously that's some of our most unique materials from the uh, university archives and special collections. Women's history, a uh, big part of that of course is the Women Veterans Historical Project collection and the performing arts, which is, if UNCG has a brand, that's a really big part of it. Uh, these were decided years ago, uh, several years ago by the Digital Projects Priorities Team and then were uh, approved by AAG as well. That's not to say that we don't consider digitization projects on other areas and subjects too, but you, if you're outside the four focus areas, you kind of have to sell yourself a little harder. Um, obviously, we look at things like grant funding, et cetera, too. If there's a grant, um, we're contractually obligated to do that project, so it sort of jumps to the front of the line, for example. But we try to do as much as possible of all projects. Um, we're getting less into the a project a year kind of thing and more into an ongoing workflow. So projects might actually continue going over several years, for example. So once the projects are in and are decided on, we get to the nuts and bolts of how we actually do the stuff. And I think that's kind of, kind of what this presentation is gonna be all about, um, how we deal with the scanning and the other digitization aspects. Um, I'm gonna start with scanning. Look, pretty pictures of scanners. This excites me, it probably doesn't excite anybody else. Um, but um, first up, let's think about um, our goal for scanning. We scan all kinds of materials. It could be photographs, could be books, scrapbooks, maps, posters. And one thing that I have to stress to people when, when they're just starting out in our digitization unit is, that we're not trying to get the best possible looking scan of an object. What we're trying to do is get the scan that most represents what the original object looks like, warts and all, and that's kind of different. You know, if we have a, if we have an, a photographic image that's really dark, for example, the scan's probably gonna be really dark too, because we're trying, again, not to make it look perfect, but to make it look like the original looks. Uh, as kind of a benchmark. Now, that's not to say you can't take that scan and then go back and manipulate a copy of it for other purposes, like for an exhibit or whatever, but you know, our, bench, our, our baseline is that we want the scan to look like the original does. We save everything as a TIFF master, which is an uncompressed image master, um, usually at 300 PPI, sometimes at 600 PPI, or for uh, slides or negatives, it may even be higher because, well, they're smaller. And that's a, th that's a thing that I also stress to people is that don't think too much about the PPI, but think more of the, uh, the actual dimensions of the image because, you know, a one inch by one inch image at 600 PPI is going to be an awful lot smaller than say a 10 inch by 10 inch image. So, um, and I hope that makes sense. And if it doesn't, please feel free to ask questions. Um, we keep track of all our scans using a spread using Google Sheets. Um, this serves two purposes for us actually, because it actually is sort of our workflow document as you can see oops, back here on the left. Um, it's our workflow document, so you can see when the object has been scanned, when the quality has been checked, when it's been uploaded into Content DM or Islandora, but it's also the place where we keep the metadata or we create the metadata for all the items. So we actually use that as the metadata that we upload to describe the object as well. Uh, the object ID column, which you see on the far right, is, the, is very important for us because it's based on the physical object, the collection that it comes out of, um, maybe the box, the folder number, et cetera. But it's also the way that we keep the scan associated with the metadata. So the scan, for example, for that top one would have that, that object ID number as its file name. That way we can merge everything back together when we're ready to put it online. So here's some examples of some scans we do. And some, 
some things that uh, to stress. Generally, when we do photos, um, original documents, letters, that kind of thing, we scan them as you see this sort of black border around the outside. And we do that for a very specific reason. It's so that um, so that you can see that we have scanned the full image. It's sort of an ethical thing with archival scanning. Uh, you leave the border around, and that, that way you can see that you're seeing all the edges of the object. Um, and then we just uh, extend the area that we're scanning out just a little bit. Um, that means you're also going to see things like tears on the edge of the pages, too. Again, we're trying to make it look exactly like the original object looks. Even if the original object is torn or damaged, though we need to represent that in the scan. Uh, there's some other weird things that kind of come up. Um, you see on the right hand side of this image, this is a scrapbook page. Scrapbooks, we've done an awful lot of. Um, I've done an awful lot of scrapbooks. Uh, we could talk to you uh, all day about scrapbooks. And in fact, uh, we have an article at the American Archive and the American Archivist about uh, about doing scrapbook digitization with Kathleen and uh, and Anna and all kinds of people. Um, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of variables to to scrapbooks, but the big one is that in a lot of cases you get pages that have things glued to them that are folded up. And if you're going to actually represent the whole scrapbook, you've got to unfold those things to give a full a full view of the image. Um, it makes it interesting for presentation. It also makes it really interesting for the actual scanning process. Um, it's one of the, some of the things that we have to think about as we're doing as we're doing digitization. Another big project that we're working on is slavery related materials. Um, Several, almost 10 years ago now, we did an LSTA grant for the North Carolina Runaway Slave Ads Project, um, which was a project using a book by Dr. Freddie Parker at North Carolina Central University. We used that book as a print reference to go back and actually locate runaway slave ads that had appeared in North Carolina newspapers through 1840. We use the microfilm of these newspapers to digitize the ads and to actually transcribe them and put them online. Um, again, we only went through 1840 because that's where the book went through and that was our source. Now, a couple of years ago, we decided we were going to go ahead and try to extend that through 1865, which actually became more of a research project for us because we had to actually locate the ads at this point. We didn't have the print resource. so. Uh, we've been working on that for several years. Uh, we had students working on it for quite a while. We worked with uh, Lisa Tolbert and one of her history classes on the project. And uh, Erica and Kathy have been doing a lot of work with this as well, actually. And it involves actually going through and looking at every newspaper that's available from the period 1840 to 1865, locating these ads, scanning them, uh, and then transcribing them. This is kind of a neat project, and it's part of a bigger initiative that's uh, that's been done out of the library called the Digital Library on American Slavery, which started out as a project that Richard worked with years ago, uh, Richard Cox and Eric, with Dr. Lauren Schweninger to put a database of materials online. And we've been working with slavery-related materials ever since. The two big ones that we're working with in digitization right now are again the slave ads project and a new grant funded project called people not property where we're digitizing slave deeds deeds uh, from deeds and other uh, legal documents relating to enslaved people in the state through the civil war material that we're getting actually from the registers of deeds in a variety of counties i think 26 total counties and that's, uh, we mentioned Claire Heckel as part of our extended family. She's the project manager on that. And that's sort of a, a merged project between my, the digitization unit and the development team in Eric. Um, and that's all part of this digital library on American slavery, which uh, again, and I'll go ahead and type that into the chat too, if you want to look. Because heaven forbid I should type and walk and chew gum at the same time. And that'll get you to the digital library on American slavery. 
So again, it's not just visual materials that we work with. We also work with a lot of audio and video materials. Um, Kathy particularly works with uh, digitizing a lot of material from cassette. There's a lot of things in SKUA that are cassette and, uh, and other type materials. Um, we actually just did a big grant project with the Women Veterans Historical Project. Uh, in that case, we actually outsourced to a vendor because there were about 300 cassettes and we didn't really want to do that in-house. Um, and actually the grant specified that we had to outsource them. But we do have the ability to digitize cassettes in-house as well. This has been mostly oral histories that were done in the 80s and 90s on portable cassette recorders. Um, we can also digitize VHS. We don't really have high-end capacity or capacity to do a lot of bulk, but we can convert uh, VHS tapes to DVDs or to digital files as well. Um, again, if we were doing a lot of those or we wanted really high quality, we probably would outsource, but we can, we can do that. Some of the software that we use uh, is Audacity, which is an open source audio editing product. Uh, we actually use iTunes quite extensively for actually converting and burning CDs, that kind of thing. Uh, we use Handbrake. We do actually, if there is a legitimate copyright okayed reason, we will occasionally rip from DVDs. Um, we can also use, Handbrake can also be used for editing and changing formats as well. It's really useful for that. It's kind of a, kind of a video Swiss army knife, if you will. Again, audio and video is not something we do a lot of. It's not something that we can do on a very high end level, but it is something that we can do. Um, and this is particularly important to us because it's a preservation issue too. The things that are saved on cassette or video cassette, other magnetic media like that are particularly vulnerable to, uh, to preservation issues. So we want to get that material, material digitized wherever possible because otherwise it's going to go away. Related to oral history, or <laughs> related to audio and video, obviously is oral history, which is something that we actually really do a lot of. Um, Erica and Kathy particularly work a lot with the Women Veterans Historical Project, uh, which if you haven't been there, is a really great project. Uh, Beth Ann is the curator of that project, as I'm sure you probably know. Um, it started out more than 20 years ago uh, with the university archivist at that time, working with uh, women who were attending women's college and UNCG on the GI Bill, uh, who had served during World War II. And it's since expanded to where we're discussing, we do interviews and collect materials from veterans from all, all conflicts. The bulk of this project is about oral history. Uh, we also collect photographs and other memorabilia from the veterans as well. Oral history is obviously the most labor intensive part um, because oral history interviews to be useful online also have to be transcribed. Uh, some of these interviews are really long too. Uh, the average is maybe an hour or two, but some of them go as long as three or four hours. There's a lot of transcription involved um, and it's a lot of work to get these, to get these online. Um, with women vets, uh, we actually do the transcription in-house, uh, unlike with most of our other oral history collections. Reason for that being is that we have kind of an institutional memory. We've been working with the oral histories for so long, we know a lot of the terminology, et cetera. Uh, and when I say we, I mean Kathy and Erica, because they're the ones who do all the work on this, really. Um, but we do annotations, for example. Um, so if there are things like acronyms or things need a little more explanation, uh, terminology, et cetera, we're more likely to know that terminology and we try to add that to the transcript uh, within brackets so that it kind of explains what's going on with that, with that term, et cetera, to make it more usable. So there's actually a lot of work and in a lot of cases, a lot of research involved in that too, because we also try to, if place names are mentioned, we try to uh, narrow down where those are and use, say, um, the authority terms for those places, et cetera. Uh, we also do a lot of community interviews, though. Uh, 
the Women Veterans is not the only oral history project we have. A lot of university archives, oral histories are online. Uh, many of those were transcribed years ago. Um, we do oral history also with the Well-Crafted NC Project, which many of you may have been uh, aware of, which is uh, related to the history of beer and brewing in the triad in North Carolina. That's a project uh, with Richard Cox and Aaron Lowermore. Um, we also have the Pride of the Community Project, which uh, I've been working on with Stacy Krim over the years and also with a, uh, originally with Jennifer Motsko and also to some extent with Patrick uh, Dollar, where we're actually interviewing members of the LGBTQ plus community in the triad. Uh, in those cases, sometimes the digitization unit is uh, well, me specifically, is actually involved in going out and doing the oral history interviews too, either recording them or in some case, cases actually doing the interviewing. Um, with those and with most of our other oral history collections, we actually outsource the transcription to a company called Rev, which is great. You send them the oral history and then they get it back to you in usually a day or two. Um, I think they basically charge something like a dollar and a half a minute at this point. Um, so that's that's another option um, for oral histories. Again, with the women vets, we tend to do it ourselves because we're doing a little more research and it's a little, the transcription's a little more involved. Now, a new thing that we're using with oral history that kind of takes the uh, transcription to another level is the oral history metadata synchronizer, which is a problem, which is a project out of the University of Kentucky. It's a video viewer that actually kind of syncs up the video and the transcript for oral history and places it online. Uh, this involves extra work because in addition to transcribing, you then need to kind of go through and time code the material. You see down at the bottom, uh, for example, um, where it says at 2.07, early history of Highland, somebody actually needs to go in and time code the little, the different sections of the oral history interview. Uh, that's done through a web interface that generates an XML file, which may be more than you really wanted to know at this point, but it allows you to jump to specific parts of the oral history interview um, based on topic uh, and the time code in the transcript. So, metadata. Uh, I tell people it's all about the metadata because basically, you know, if we scan a bunch of stuff, particularly a bunch of photos that don't have any text in them or anything and put them online, that's lovely. It's wonderful. They're pretty pictures, but nobody can find them without the metadata. Um, so the metadata, I think, is a very, is maybe the most important part in a lot of ways of what we do because it makes everything discoverable. Um, without getting too in the weeds on metadata. In the past, we have used a metadata schema or a template called Dublin Core, um, which has a related template called, or a schema called Qualified Dublin Core, which is a little more granular, um, but nowhere near the level of some other metadata uh, schema we could use. Dublin Core was initially designed to make to kind of be a low barrier to entry for digitization projects many years ago so that people didn't have to do really hardcore granular metadata. You could basically get started on a project with the, with the 10 to 12 fields that Dublin Core allowed and be on your way. It was sort of standardized, but it was kind of wild west. There weren't really a lot of rules. There weren't really a lot of standards for Dublin Core. And it has evolved interestingly over the years uh people interpreted a lot of different ways uh many of them i think wrong but um it has expanded over the years and what we use for our digital collections has also expanded over the years too because there are fields that we needed that weren't included in dublin core so we're sort of using what i call um modified dublin core with a lot of made up fields basically. Now I'll talk a little more about the fact that we're migrating out of content DM, which very much likes the Dublin core metadata schema into an open source product called Island Dora. That's gonna be the platform that, that uh, displays our digital collections going forward. 
Uh, Island Dora likes a metadata schema called MODS, which is the meta, I forget what it's an acronym for, but um, it's a much more granular system. Um, it's more in tune with what you would see with, say, Mark. And um, it actually is very much more standards compliant, which hopefully will make all the catalogers in the room much happier that we're moving to it. Um, it's going to be, I think, a lot more consistent, a lot more standards compliant. It's also a lot more work, but um, it's something that we're happy to do. And I will say that Tiffany and Callie, thank you, Tiffany. Um, thank you for all the work you're doing and for that the chat you just put through uh, showing what, uh, what it was a uh, acronym for. Uh, Tiffany and Callie, and uh, if many of you will remember Wilson Miracle, was working as a temp with us for a long time too, converting a lot of our Dublin Core metadata into MODS metadata so that we can migrate into Islandora, which actually is turning out to be my big project during the pandemic. So um, a lot of that pre-work and that great work that they have done um, upgrading our metadata into the MODS format has been a big help. Um, so doing that, there are a lot of specific tools that we're using. Um, Dublin Core is basically what we would call a flat metadata schema. It could be represented very easily in a spreadsheet because there's not really any hierarchy to it. Um, so, you know, it's basically, it could be expressed as rows and columns. Mods is a little more complicated. It uses, um, XML format, which stands for extensible markup language, looks a lot like HTML that you may know from building web pages. Uh, it's a little bit different though. It's a markup language uh, that allows for hierarchical metadata that's a little harder to represent in a spreadsheet. So what we've had to do then is convert all our flat spreadsheet related metadata into this XML format. Uh, we have kind of a big process for doing that, um, and uh, I'm not going to go into all the details on it because, trust me, you just assume that I not do that. But the program, the uh, the applications that we generally use for this are four. There's Excel, Google Sheets. We go back and forth between Excel and Google Sheets a lot. A program called Open Refine, which if you haven't used it, is a really neat open source data manipulation program. You can do all kinds of things with it. Um, and we also use Oxygen, which is an XML editing program. And I'll show you a little more about each of these in, here in just a second. Um, but we're using that to convert our spreadsheet data into XML format that can be used in Islandora. So here's where we start out. This could be Google Sheets. Uh, anything we do in Excel kind of looks similar to. There's some parts of this process that are easier to do in Excel and some parts that are easier to do in Google Sheets. So we kind of go back and forth here. This is where we do our initial metadata entry, but it's also where we do our metadata cleanup and a good chunk of the manipulation. For example, uh, as you'll see on screen, uh, in the old Dublin Core schema we were using, dates might be one field um, and we would have to just sort of cram everything into it whether it fits or not so it might so a date might be october 17th 1930 or it might be 1935 through 1938 uh, we would all be throwing that into one field whereas in mods we can divvy it up um, so that we can have a range of dates or a specific one date um, we can also break things out as to date created or date issued, for example. Date created being obviously the when the item was created, uh, say for a photograph or something like that. Whereas date issued, for example, would be more when something was published. So that's the kind of thing we're breaking out. And we're doing that step either in Excel or in Google Sheets. Uh, there's a lot of cleanup and transformation that we're doing. Um, different controlled vocabularies are used uh, in the two different schemas, etc. So we're doing a lot of that work in Google Sheets and Excel. Then basically when we have it finished to the point where we're happy with it and 
I may remind you that nothing is ever 100% perfect. Nothing is ever going to be 100% perfect, but we try. Um, then we use a tool called Open Refine. Open Refine is really neat. Again, it was originally des designated, it was originally uh, built as something called Google Refine. It was part of the Google suite of tools. It actually allows you to import data and manipulate it in a lot of various ways. We only scratch the surface of what Open can re Refine can do. Um, in our usage, the biggest part of what we use now is importing the spreadsheets that we've created with our metadata, and we use the export function in OpenRefine to reformat that using a template that I built to convert it to XML format. Um, and you can kind of see what that template looks like. Um, what it does basically is take each row of the spreadsheet and apply that template that you see on the left to it so that it then creates an XML file that looks like the one you see on the right here. Um, we don't necessarily need to go into all the details on that. Um, XML is, is kind of fun, but um, it's not for everybody. Then, when we have uh, basically a whole collection of items, so that might be you know, a couple hundred or a couple thousand items, exported to XML, it gives us one big XML file. We use a program called Oxygen XML to do, uh, this is a paid program actually, which does a couple of other transformations. Among the things that it does are cleaning up some of the null values, um, making sure that everything is compliant with the mod spec because it'll flag it as It'll give you a big red ugly flag if you've got something that's not compliant with the mods uh, metadata spec. And also then it breaks it into, if you've got 2000 items, we need to end up with 2000 individual XML files rather than just the one for the whole collection. So it actually does that splitting as well. Um, this has been an interesting part of my last year and I think for, uh, particularly for Tiffany too, learning uh, learning how to use all these XML tools. Uh, that's actually been kind of fun, but yeah, my definition, your definition of fun may, may vary from mine. Um, the idea coming out of this though for metadata is that we want to be able to share our metadata across multiple platforms. And what you see here on screen is uh, what things look like currently in our content DM installation. Um, this is you know, some of the metadata fields we're using. Um, this is, I should have actually included the picture here because it's a picture of the circulation desk from 1981, which is kind of cool. And that's why I chose it. But for some reason, I ended up not putting the picture in there. I don't understand why. But the idea being that we, uh, not only are these things going to be displayed in the context of our own digital collections, but we also share our metadata so that our materials will show up in places like the Digital Public Library of America, WorldCat, every item, all of the 60,000 items representing about three quarters of a million digital files that we put together are also available in WorldCat. Um, and part of the reason that we wanna use structured metadata like Mods and Dublin Core is it so that we can share things across platforms and they'll work correctly. For example, this is what it looks like in DPLA. Um, as you see, the arrows kind of show where the, where the different metadata fields go uh, when they come out of our record into DPLA. Um, similarly, uh, how things show up in WorldCat, um, where again, our metadata is reused and, uh, and then fit into, and then actually map to mark fields. Now, once we move over to the Islandora product, that's gonna be a little easier. We're gonna have a little more control over how these mark fields are mapped, which will make some of our objects look a little less weird when they get into WorldCat, which will actually be very nice. But again, that's another area of work that's happening in our migration. Um, and I guess migration's probably what I'm gonna start talking about here in just a few minutes. So as we get to putting it online. Um, a little history, uh, we started out back in the early 2000s doing static websites. Uh, 
there's a project long before I got here called Beyond Buildings and Books, which was a grant funded project where we digitized a lot of documents from the early history of State Normal, which is the predecessor to UNCG. Um, after that, we moved into homegrown content management systems and the original uh, iterations of the Women Veterans Historical Project and Civil Rights Greensboro were in homegrown content management systems that were built by the Eric Development Team, which are actually really good and in many cases do things, I think, better than some of the, uh, <laughs> some of the subsequent products we've used. But it got to the point where it really wasn't sustainable for us to build a new custom project for each digital collection um, and to get those mounted quickly. Uh, so around, I think, 2008, this is a little before I got here, we started using a product called Content DM, which is sort of the industry standard. It was developed by OCLC, um, which was great in that it actually allowed us to mount collections really quickly. We could get things online quickly, what we lost in the process was sort of the customization ability from when we were building our own systems. Um, so yeah, obviously it's a little bit of a trade-off. Content DM has served us reasonably well for the last 10 years or so. Um, here's an example of how things look in Content DM. Frankly, in my, in my own view, I think it's kind of a clunky interface. Uh, it's an old platform. It's not mobile friendly. There are a lot of search issues. Uh, particularly if you have faceted search and full text items, which many of you probably run into. And a couple of years ago, um, they changed the pricing model, which meant we would have had to migrate to a cloud hosted version, which would have been very expensive and would also have allowed, we had to lose control and customization. So at that point, we decided to migrate to a program called Islandora. It's an open source platform. Um, I really like it. I'm very happy with it. Uh, you will probably not be happy with it because you're not seeing it yet because we're in the process of migrating right now. That's, again, sort of what I'm doing as I'm sitting here working from home. It's uh, much more in tune with varied digital collections, uh, with archival collections. It's more hierarchical. Again, it uses the mods metadata schema. I think it's going to give us a much cleaner interface, as you can see here. Uh, it's much more mobile friendly. It allows us to organize, organize collections a lot more rationally. The search functionality is much better. Now, the trade-offs are that it's a less user-friendly backend, so there's a much steeper learning curve. Um, I'm actually doing a presentation on this tomorrow for, for several people who are going to be working with uh, Islander going forward. Um, it's an open source product and that's good and bad because it means that, you know, there's no actual company that we can go to for tech support, except that we're actually using a consultant. So there's some, some, uh, a paid consultants, so there's some, some tech support availability, but in general, it's an open source product and there it's not put out by a company. It's an open source community product. Um, there's new metadata schema, which, has actually allowed us to sort of rethink our digital collections and reorganize them in a way that I think is going to work a lot better and make them a lot more accessible to people. Um, seemed like as good an opportunity as any to go ahead and do that. Uh, and hopefully, you know, the next time we do a major platform shift like this, I will be retired. Um, it's also more customizable than Content DM. Now, that can be a blessing and a curse, though, because, you know, if there are more customizations, there are more customizations that you have to think about and agonize over. Um, in a lot of cases, I've been told, particularly by younger people using our students, that maybe we think too much about our interface customization because it means you have to sort of learn a new interface with each different collection you're using. So um, I've tended to move toward less customization than more because it makes it simpler to use but that's not always realistic because in some cases you need to do things a little differently but again you know the more customization options can be good and bad so what else do we do in digital collections and then i'll i'm trying to finish this up pretty quickly so i have time for questions um inside and outside the building we do a lot of community events we've done scanning days we do exhibits related to 
the slavery projects to well crafted to the pride of the community project uh we actually go out and occasionally do oral history interviews um i do a lot of faculty research project and grant consultations with faculty members here at uncg work with a lot of classes as well particularly in public history but recently in lis um, and in english as well and we do an awful lot of collaborations with community partners either to come up with projects that we might embark on or to try to help them get rolling so they can do projects kind of on their own um, in the past we've worked with uh, the hayes taylor ymca for example with their youth program uh, many of you may recommend the vintage or may remember the vintage beyonds programs we did every year that were sort of erica callie and carolyn Schenkel's thing um, which were really fun where we actually used our cookbook collections to um, people actually used our vintage cookbooks to actually cook things that we actually served and 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 online that was that was a fun project so um we try to do more than just digitize we try to actually do things that actually promote use of the collection as well a couple of things that we don't do that some people might be curious about is we generally don't scan for classroom use or basically anything that's not going to be made publicly available that's sort of our mission in the digitization unit is to scan and work with things that are going online for public consumption if it's going to be behind a password if it's only going to be available for a class generally we don't do that now if it's one or two images sometimes i will <laughs> obviously it's you know there's precedent setting etc but generally our mission is only things that are going to be made made publicly available we do not acquire or process archival collections we're part of era we're not part of skua uh, that said, I often work with SKUA on talking to potential donors about collections uh, with a look toward possibly digitizing them in the future. We've also done some work with community organizations digitizing things that are not actually going to be acquired by the library. They're basically letting us borrow them and digitize them which I think is kind of a neat thing. There's some of my favorite connection collections It allows us to digitize stuff and the people still get to keep them. We don't do things like restoration or image manipulation. We don't have the ability to digitize motion picture film or vinyl albums, though I do have contacts that we could use to outsource those. And we don't do heavy duty audio video editing or production. Uh, that's sort of the DMC's thing. Um, we will crop audio and video, and that's most of what we do. So um, very quickly, I sort of, talk to several people in the unit to sort of get a feeling for what some of their favorite projects and collections were. We'll start with Callie's. Uh, she really likes the cookbooks and really likes Christmas and cookies. Um, and was particularly uh, interested in this one postcard from the I Wish to Say collection. Uh, Callie also works a lot with the American Publishers Trade Bindings project. And this was one of her favorite covers from and bindings from that collection. Um, Erica works a lot with the Women Veterans Historical Project, and she has actually donated a lot of uh, a lot of cookbooks and materials to our home economics and household pamphlets collection. A couple of which you can see here. Um, Kathy works with maps and oversize a lot, and <laughs> she says it can be really frustrating, but it's actually really cool stuff too. We actually have a lot of historical maps of Greensboro going back to the 1880s online. Uh, this being one of them that I think is from the either 1880s or 1890s. Um, scrapbooks, uh, she's worked a lot with scrapbooks as well. And uh, on the right, you see Anna Gove. We've digitized almost the entirety of the Anna Gove collection and it's, uh, it's pretty cool stuff. She was uh, one of the first women physicians licensed in North Carolina and of course was the physician for UNCG and is who the health center is named after. But she also did a lot of work with the Red Cross during World War II. There's really neat stuff um, in her collection. And of course mine. Um, I'm the local history guy, if you will. Um, I'm really into the city directories because I use them a lot. Um, we have a very significant amount of urban renewal and urban development materials from the post-war era. And many of you may know, I research supermarket history and um, this AMP photo is, 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 is one of my favorites. 
Um, so again, that's just some collections that we all like. And now I'm ready to throw it up for questions. All right, thank you so much, David. So I have not seen any questions come up in the chat, um, but if you have questions, please feel free to go ahead and put those in the chat now, or if you would like to unmute yourself um, and ask your question or um, give your comment, that is great. So we'll give, I'll give you all a minute to compose stuff in the chat or um, unmute yourselves and speak. Charlie, I can I can show you more sheet music than you could ever imagine. <laughs> and Aaron Lee, thank you for uh for for being here. All right. Well, I'm seeing a lot of uh, gratitude, but uh, not a lot of questions coming up. So I'm going to go ahead and stop our recording here. And again, I want to thank David so much.